On February 20th, 2021, United Airlines Flight 328's Pratt & Whitney PW400 engine broke apart midair, with debris falling on residential neighborhoods in Colorado. Thankfully, shortly after the incident, the plane landed safely in Denver, and all passengers were alive and safe. There is no doubt that for those on board, this must have been an absolutely terrifying incident. I can only imagine what it would be like hearing the engine break up and seeing the flames outside of the plane's window. And to be sure, coming on the heels of the relatively recent fatal crashes in 2019 and 2020 of the Boeing 737 MAX in Indonesia and Ethiopia, flyers might be asking themselves just how safe it is to fly these days. Maybe, especially for domestic travel, it just makes more sense to drive. Welcome to Data Demystified, I'm Jeff Gallick, and on this episode, we'll dig deep into the statistics of commercial flight safety. And if you stick around to the end, I'll provide as good an answer as you're likely to get to the question of whether flying is a safe way to travel. Along the way, I'll show you the right way to compare relative risks, something you can apply to any context, not just flying. To start off, let's agree that it's hard to judge any risk in absolute terms. If I tell you that about 570 people in the US die each year while using heavy machinery, that sounds horrible. Those are real people with real families who lost their lives. But to put that into a bit of context, six times more people, or around 3,700 people, die of drowning each year. If you're thinking about behaviors to take to limit your risk of death, you should probably be more careful around water than around heavy machinery. That is, in absolute terms, knowing that 570 people died from heavy machinery doesn't really tell you much about how risky using heavy machinery is, compared to anything else you might actually do. Risk is, and should be, evaluated in relative terms. As in, how risky is one behavior relative to another? Now, to be fair, you're unlikely to be facing a situation where you could choose to either go for a swim or work with a bulldozer, but the basic idea of making a trade-off is there. If you had that choice, you could determine how risky it would be to engage in either behavior. Beyond personal choice, as a society, we might want to consider relative risks like these to determine where to allocate resources to improve safety. If a particular behavior proves to be incredibly dangerous and even fatal, we might want to insist on stricter safety protocols and spend more on hiring inspectors to ensure that those protocols are followed. If a behavior isn't all that risky, we may choose to devote fewer resources to policing it. So what does this have to do with safety of flying? Whenever we buy a ticket to go on a trip, we're making a decision about the relative safety of modes of transportation. After all, especially for domestic travel, flying is only one option for getting to where you're going. So when we want to answer the question of whether flying is safe, we actually have to answer the question, is flying safe relative to traveling some other way? And to keep things simpler still, we're only going to look at fatalities. Now, to be sure, you can get seriously injured flying or driving, but since many of us disagree with what a serious injury is, I'd rather just focus on something that is objective, and I think we can all agree that death is pretty objective. Now, when we assess risk like this, it's actually impossible to do so on an individual basis. I can't tell you if your plane is going to crash or if your car will get into a fatal accident. Instead, I can look back to see across all flights and all road trips how often fatalities occur. The National Transportation Safety Board, or NTSB, provides data on this, and we can quickly see that in 2018, in the US, the last year where we have really good data for, 24,221 individuals lost their lives in automobile accidents, and only one person lost their life on a commercial airline. So I guess that answers the question, flying is way safer than driving, right? Well, not quite. Yes, more people died driving than flying, that's not in dispute at all. The challenge though is that this is the wrong comparison to make. Let me explain. Imagine if there was only one flight per year, and we saw that one person died each year. Well, that would be awful, the risk of flying would be incredibly high. Now instead imagine if there were billions of flights per year. Well, now, one death out of billions of flights seems way less problematic. The point is that you can't just compare the absolute number of deaths to get a sense of risk. Instead, you need to compare rates of death. So let's look at a very common rate that is reported for travel, fatalities per million miles traveled. That is, for every million miles of flying or million miles of driving, how many fatalities are there? Well, in 2018, US commercial passenger flights flew about 8.5 billion miles in total and US drivers drove about 3.2 trillion miles. So now we can compute the fatalities per million miles traveled for each mode of travel. For flying, it is 0.001 deaths per million miles flown, and for cars, it is 0.007 per million miles driven. Those are hard numbers to compare, so let me present them a different way by asking the question, how many miles of travel would you need to equal one fatality? 
For flying, you'd have to fly about 8.5 billion miles before you get a single fatality. Whereas for driving, you would only have to drive about 134 million miles before you get a single fatality. Now clearly, no one person is ever going to fly or drive that much. But as a society, we sure will and sure do. So if the question is which, from a society's perspective, demands more attention to increasing safety, it's very clearly driving. In other words, flying seems to be a whole lot safer. And yet, this is still not the best way to assess relative safety. But before we get to that, if you could take a moment to like this video, subscribe to this channel, and click that little bell icon so you don't miss out on any new content I put out, I would really appreciate it. And with that said, let's see how you really should be assessing relative risk. The key is to realize that we don't spend the same amount of time traveling the same distance with both of these modes of transport. To travel, say, 500 miles in a plane takes about an hour, but to do that in a car could take eight hours or more. And the risk you face depends entirely on how long you were exposed to that risk. Every second you are in a plane or in a car means you are at risk of an accident and possibly death. Think of it this way. If you spend eight hours in a car, that's eight hours that you are at risk. But if you only spend one hour on a plane, that's seven extra hours that you are doing something other than traveling. Something that hopefully has little to no risk involved. The risk only exists so long as you're doing that activity, and since driving takes a lot longer to reach the same destination, your time at risk increases compared to flying. So to really fairly compare the relative risk of flying to driving, we need to compare total hours spent doing each. Well, in the US, airline passengers spend a total of about 19 million hours per year flying. That's compared to about 84 billion hours spent driving each year. If we compare the fatality rates for million hours spent traveling, we see that for flying, there are 0.05 fatalities per million hours of flying. And for driving, there are 0.28 fatalities per million hours of driving. Again, flipping those around a different way, you would need to drive for about 3.5 million hours before seeing a fatality, but would need to fly for 19.3 million hours before seeing a fatality there. In other words, the risk of fatality while flying, when calculated this way, is about 5.6 times less than the risk of fatality while driving. This is all well and good, but this is just for 2018, and it doesn't change the visceral nature of reading a news story of something like a flight full of passengers crashing. If a single Boeing 737 MAX crashes in the US, that would result in somewhere around 200 deaths. If that were to occur, the math of our risk comparison would change dramatically. It would now take only 96,440 hours of flying time to equal one death, making flying 35 times deadlier than driving. So the fear of flying isn't crazy at all if we imagine something this horrific. Thankfully, however, those types of accidents are incredibly rare and getting rarer every year. Here's a chart showing the number of fatalities per million hours of flying by US airlines. With the exception of some horrible crashes in the 90s and the deaths of those who were aboard the flights used in the 9-11 attacks in 2001, the rate has stayed quite low for the last decade or so. However, despite that, the risk of death from flying is actually slightly higher than the risk of driving. If we look at the last 10 years of data we have access to, it would take 3.5 million hours of driving to result in one death, but it would take only 2.8 million hours of flying to do the same. In other words, over this 10-year period, flying was about 25% more deadly than driving in terms of deaths per hour traveled. So. Even though, on the surface, flying seems safer since so few people die while flying each year. When you work out the risk per time spent traveling, flying is actually slightly more dangerous. However, there is still more to consider here that might temper our conclusion. First, whereas total flight hours of commercial airlines is pretty well known since airlines report that information to the NTSB, the total driving hours is an estimate. If that estimate is too high, we're understating how dangerous driving is. Second, we're assuming that the time you're spending not traveling, because flying is so much faster, is risk-free, but that's not fair at all. While not traveling, you might be sitting at home watching TV, a pretty risk-free activity, or you might be riding your motorcycle without a helmet, a decidedly risky activity. In other words, though you save time by flying, you don't automatically limit your risk, since we don't know what you'll be doing during that extra time. And critically, the part of all this that is missing is the benefit of flying. We've talked about the risk, but think about how much a few extra hours of your day is worth to you. If you fly from New York to Miami, that's about a three hour flight. If you drive that distance nonstop, that'll take you about 20 hours. Ignoring the physical challenge of driving that distance, how much is that extra 17 hours of your day worth to you? I don't know the answer, but it's sure worth something. So are you willing to trade off a slight increase in risk for the benefit of extra time? 
Well, I can't answer that either, but that's the real calculation that you should be doing. When you think about relative risk, it's always risk versus something else. But if you ignore that the risk likely has some kind of benefit associated with it, you miss the whole point of even calculating something like this. So next time you are faced with a choice to fly or to drive, know that the risk of fatality is actually slightly higher for flying. But is that extra risk worth the benefit to you? Only you can answer that question. Finally, as always, thanks so much for watching.